Today our presentation is called Charismatic Renewal. We started this series off, if you will remember, by looking at the veracity of the Bible and the creation account, comparing it with evolutionary ideas, and then determining whether the Bible can be trusted or not. And then we followed with prophetic views and we looked at the, the view of the reformers regarding the clash between truth and error, between righteousness and unrighteousness, between Christ and Antichrist. And in that lecture, we discussed the little horn power of Daniel chapter 7, who would change times and laws. Subsequently, we looked at the issue of the change of the law, and we saw that Rome had indeed changed the commandments of God. And one of the prominent changes that was made was the change of the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day of the week. In other words, from Saturday to Sunday. And Rome claimed that this was a mark of her ecclesiastical power and that she was above the Bible as a consequence. And so we had a look at Revelation chapter 13 where the beasts of Revelation chapter 13 were discussed and we saw that they were a hieroglyph, a combination of the beasts that you found in Daniel chapter 7. And that the reformers had all claimed that the first beast in Revelation chapter 13 was the Roman papacy. And that the second beast would be similar in that it would eventually introduce legislation where the state would control conscience in terms of religious matters. And we looked at the implementation of the mark of the beast and where we stand in the stream of time regarding that issue. And we saw that there was indeed a movement towards Sunday legislation on a worldwide basis which would honor a law which was solely associated with the Roman church and not with scripture. And in Revelation chapter 13, we read that the second beast, which we identified with uh, the United States of America in its Protestant form, uh, would have certain criteria. And he doeth great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. Now we discussed this in the last lecture in some detail and we came to the conclusion that this fire was not nuclear power because you don't deceive anyone by that means but that it was a false outpouring of the Holy Spirit by which people would be compelled to believe that the Spirit of God was in a movement that would compel conscience and dictate morality even at the level of the state. Now, how did this come about and how did it happen that we have moved from a time period where the reformers were so clear on the issue of who the Antichrist was to a position where it has become so fuzzy that nobody believes anything that the reformers believed in regard to their doctrine on Antichrist. Well, it is fascinating that the charismatic movement had a great part to play in this. And one of the things that it achieved was to bring together evangelical Christians and Catholicism because the manifestations of the Spirit were similar in both, therefore it had to be the same Spirit. So we have to investigate this issue. And then, not so long ago, Tony, Tony Palmer was the man, 
he's an evangelical that also belongs basically to the Roman Catholic, or belonged to the Roman Catholic Charismatic Renewal Movement, and he felt it his duty to bring this message to the evangelical world that they should reunite with the papacy. Friends and companions, I'm on my way to Rome for two highly important meetings, the Pontifical Office for the Promotion of Christian Unity and Pope Francis. We're discussing the variety and breadth of all the feedback from the publication of Prof. Francis's video, The Miracle of Unity Has Begun. It has been viewed in its various forms more than 800,000 times, and we now have a large delegation of non-Roman Catholic church leaders who want to meet Pope Francis and to take the next step towards unity. Please keep us in your prayers. We're living in a historic moment, your brother in Christ. Now, Tony Palmer has since died as a result of an accident, which is a tragedy. But nevertheless, he put something into motion which the Bible actually predicted in advance, that the wound would heal. Now, we saw that the papacy received the political wound when it lost its political power in 1798, when, the, when Napoleon abolished the papal government. But that it would get it back, the wound would be healed, and in 1929 it got its power back. But it also had a spiritual wound, which the Protestant world had inflicted and caused a separation. Prior to that, the Eastern religion, the Orthodox, had separated, so the power had been, well, weakened. And now there would be unity again, and the spiritual wound was supposed to heal. Now, when Tony Palmer held his speech, here is Tony Palmer, he uh, attended a convention that was led by Kenneth Copeland, and Kenneth Copeland made comments as to a video by the Pope requesting this unity to commence. And it's interesting that uh, Kenneth Copeland then prayed in tongues for the Pope. Now this history is complicated because the very fact that it is a fulfillment of prophecy and that it is associated with outpourings of the Spirit seem to imply that this is something which might not necessarily be from God, but could be from a deceptive spirit. So, how do we reconcile these issues? Pope at Charismatic Rally in Stadium invites them to the Vatican in 2017. Francis also said Catholic Charismatics have a special role to play in healing divisions amongst Christians by exercising spiritual ecumenism hmm. or praying with members of other Christian churches and communities who share a belief in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now it's one thing to preach that we believe in one Lord and Savior but if the criteria associated with that Lord and Savior are so diverse and so different that some of them cannot be reconciled, then how do you cope with this issue? Protestantism has always taught that the cross was the means whereby atonement for the sins of mankind have been achieved. Whereas Catholicism teaches that atonement is not by the blood of the Lamb, but by the works of Christ, and that Christ need not have died, that salvation could have been by some other means, but the Bible clearly says that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. Moreover, Catholicism teaches that uh, the sacrifice is a continual sacrifice as enacted in the Mass, and the Bible teaches that by one sacrifice he forever made perfect. The Bible teaches that there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, and Catholicism teaches that there are many mediators, 
making Mary, for example, the co-redemptrix and mediatrix for the people of God. So these are thunderous issues which should separate Protestantism from Catholicism. Can two agree? Or can two walk together lest they agree? So how is it possible that a spirit can reunite error with truth and then still be the spirit of God? Is the spirit not the spirit of truth? So in 2017, when they want to get together at the charismatic rally, they want to celebrate this ecumenical spirit that has been achieved through this very movement. And at the same time, they want to prepare for the great 2017 jubilee of the Protestant Reformation, where they want to join together and celebrate it as one for the first time in history. So that would put an end to Protestantism as we know it. Finally, Pope Francis invited the crowd, which included charismatics from 55 countries, to come to St. Peter's Square for Pentecost 2017 to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the movement. The Catholic charismatic movement began during a retreat held in 1967 with students and staff from the Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. It's interesting that when this excitement reached the papacy itself, Pope Paul gave an address where he also used ecstatic languages. I expect you all charismatics from around the world to celebrate your great jubilee with the Pope at Pentecost 2017 in St. Peter's Square. So this was the Catholic charismatic movement and the Catholic charismatic movement had exactly the same manifestations as the Pentecostal charismatic movement. And if the, the functions or the outpourings are identical, then the spirit is identical. This is the argument. And if that brings people together, then doctrine must be laid aside because the spirit is the norm and glues everyone together. Question. Can God's Spirit speak against the truth of the doctrines of the Bible, or can he not? Can he be divided against himself? It's interesting that in 2008, in an interview with journal journalist Emil Hakenis, the Jesuit professor, uh, Edward Kimmen, then time General Secretary of the Netherlands Bishop Conference, proclaimed that there remains hardly any reason to remain a Protestant. And he saw Protestantism as an action group that forgot to dissolve itself. And a group that had not recognized the significance of a global visible leadership personality such as the Pope. And we must not forget that the papacy claims infallibility to be free from error when it comes to the proclamation of dogma. Moreover, he stated that he doubted that the Reformation would still exist after 2017, and that is the year when Protestantism commemorates its 500th year of existence. Now, this is a long study which is in another series, and people can access it. And Protestantism, he said, should return to the Mother Church. Now, if they return to the Mother Church and they accept the authority of a human being whom the Bible, by criteria, has defined as the man of sin, then they are choosing another master. And they will, in effect, have chosen an earthly representative over and above the heavenly representative. Because Rome teaches that salvation is through the system and through its sacramental system, whereas Jesus Christ came all the way down to touch humanity personally, so that we have direct access through him to God. Religious news services report that the two sides have decided to bury the hatchet. And they brought out a document from Conflict to Communion, which we have also analyzed in another lecture series, 
which can be accessed and that says that there's little purpose in dredging up centuries-old conflicts. In the document, the two churches recognize that in an age of ecumenism and globalization, the celebration requires a new approach, focusing on reciprocal admission of guilt and on highlighting the progress made by Lutheran-Catholic dialogue in the last 50 years. The fact that the struggle for the truth in the 16th century led to a loss of unity in Western Christendom belongs to the dark pages of church history. And in 2017, we must confess openly that we have been guilty before Christ of damaging the unity of the church. I thought the Protestant Reformation was a new great light in what was called the Dark Ages, and that the Protestant Reformation wasn't darkness in the light of the Dark Ages. So here is somewhat of a confusion. And if they have to acknowledge guilt for the Reformation, that's an acknowledgement that they weren't following the Spirit of Christ. That would negate the entire Protestant Reformation. Now Hebrews 11 verse 1 has this verse. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now verse 6 says, without faith it is impossible to please God. And I've analyzed this verse many times, but for the sake of completeness, let's look at it again. If you had to have an earthly judge who said to you, you are a witness, therefore come forward and please give the evidence for what you have not seen. Then people will think that the judge has a mental problem. If on the other hand the judge says, will the first witness please step up and testify as to what he or she has seen, and the witness says, Your Honour, this is what I did not see. What would the judge say? Well, the witness has a mental problem. So please get a white coat or something and remove him or her from the stage. Because this definition makes no sense on a human level. Because there is no such thing as evidence for things one has not seen, and there is no substance to something that one hopes for. If I hope to marry someone or other, if that person isn't really there, but is just a figment of my imagination, then there's no substance to it. It's a vague hope, but there's no substance. So the whole definition makes no sense on an earthly level. And yet the Bible says that without faith it is impossible to please God. So how do you get around this issue? Faith is based on what God said in his word. If God said so, it is so. Whether I see it or whether I don't see it. Whether I experience it or whether I don't experience it. King, we will not bow down to your image. And our God is more than able to save you out of your hand. But, even if he does not, we will not bow down. What's that? That's faith. That's faith. Based on the word of God. Based on what God had said. There was no evidence at all that they were going to be saved. There was no evidence at all that God would intervene. But by faith, they stood. And this is very important. So scripture is the basis of faith. Abraham hoped for a city whose builder and maker was God. He, he hoped for a city that was somewhere in heaven. Had he ever seen it? No. But he was willing to become a sojourner in a foreign land 
based on a hope that he would never see in his lifetime and he was faithful right up until the end. That's faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Then how can we base faith on all kinds of physical manifestations, which you can see and which you can describe? If you say, I want to see you that I am accepted by God, give me a gift such as speaking in tongue, and I get the gift, that's a manifestation that you can witness to that you can describe or better still I need gold teeth and you get them that's a manifestation that you can witness to then it's no longer evidence of things not seen but actually perceived and therefore it no longer fulfills the criteria of the definition of faith so faith in Protestant thinking is word-based not experiential Whereas in Catholic thinking, Ignatius Loyola taught that you have to have experiential religion. You have to experience it. And the way to start the process is to imagine yourself into a position or situation until it becomes a reality. Till you actually have manifestations and can speak and communicate with the spirit world and can have outpourings and ecstasies and everything that goes with it. And then the experience becomes the norm rather than the word. This is very dangerous because you do not know whether the experience comes from God or elsewhere if you do not test the Spirit. And what is the criterion for testing the Spirit? The Word of God. There is no other criterion. Martin Luther, as a Protestant source, is always worthwhile quoting. So let's see how Martin Luther thought about the outpouring of the Spirit of God. He who has made himself master of the principles and text of the Word runs little risk of committing errors. A theologian should be thoroughly in possession of the basis and source of faith. That is to say, the Holy Scriptures. Armed with this knowledge, it was that I confounded and silenced all my adversaries. For they seek not to fathom and understand the Scriptures. They run them over negligently and drowsily. They speak, they write, they teach according to the suggestions of their heedless imaginations. My counsel is that we draw water from the true source and fountain, that is that we diligently search the scriptures. That's a very sound piece of advice from Martin Luther. What else have you got to tell us, Martin? Now what the third person is, the holy evangelist St. John teaches in chapter 15 where he says, But when the Comforter is come, which I will send unto you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. Jesus speaking. Here Christ speaks not only of the office and work of the Holy Ghost, but also of his substance and faith. He goes out or proceeds from the Father, that is, his going out or his proceeding is without all beginning and everlasting. Therefore the Holy Prophet Joel gives him the name and calls him the Spirit of the Lord. So it's not a new manifestation according to Martin Luther, but an eternal manifestation. The Holy Spirit has always existed. Not something new, not something unknown. It's well known. He continues, the Son suffers himself to be given to the world and to be lifted up on the cross as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, that whosoever believed in him shall not perish but have eternal life. To this work comes afterwards the third person of the Holy Ghost who kindles faith in the heart through the word and so regenerates us and makes us the children of God. And that is so beautiful. That is so solid. That is so profound. 
Martin Luther continues, we ought not to criticize, explain, or judge the scriptures by our mere reason, but diligently with prayer meditate thereon and seek their meaning. The devil and temptations also afford us occasion to learn and understand the scriptures by experience and practice. Without these, we should never understand them. However diligently we read and listen to them, the Holy Ghost must here be our only master and tutor. And let youth have no shame to learn that preceptor. When I find myself assailed by temptation, I forthwith lay hold of some text of the Bible, which Jesus extends to me, as this, that he died for me, and whence I derive infinite comfort. So where does the Holy Spirit lead you to, according to Martin Luther? To the Scriptures. Go to the Scriptures. This is what it's about. John 14, 15 and 17, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. Remember the three definitions of truth in the Bible? Thy word is truth. All thy commandments are truth, and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So the Holy Spirit must lead you to the Scriptures. The Holy Spirit must lead you to obedience to the commandments of God, and the Holy Spirit must lead you to Christ. That's the function of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't function of its own accord. It doesn't speak on its own behalf. It always has to lead you to these principles of truth. Mark chapter 16, verse 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. Luke 24, verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Now this work word in the Greek means skill. It doesn't mean you become Superman. It means you will receive the skill to do what the function is of the Holy Spirit, to proclaim the commandments, the Word, and Jesus. That's what he will do. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. So this is the skill that you will receive in order to proclaim Jesus as the source of all life and salvation. Now here's another Protestant writer. And the book is The Acts of the Apostles. It is not a conclusive evidence that a man is a Christian because he manifests spiritual ecstasy. You find spiritual ecstasy in Buddhism. You find spiritual ecstasy in shamanism. You find spiritual ecstasy in Hinduism. You find it in all religious manifestations upon this planet. So there's no evidence that you are a Christian because you have spiritual ecstasy. Under extraordinary circumstances, holiness is not rapture. It is an entire surrender to the will of God. It is living by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is doing the will of our Heavenly Father. It is trusting God in trial, in darkness, as well as in the light. It is walking by faith and not by sight. It is relying on God with unquestionable confidence and resting in His love. I believe that what we've just read is in total harmony with what Scripture teaches. It is not essential for us to be able to define just what the Holy Spirit is. Christ tells us that the Spirit is the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, which proceeds from the Father. It is plainly declared regarding the Holy Spirit that in His work of guiding men in all truth, He shall not speak of Himself. So there's another criterion of the Holy Spirit which is very important. So when I worship, do I address my worship directly to the Holy Spirit or does the Holy Spirit lead me 
to accept Christ as my personal saviour and as my intercessor and as my advocate. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I believe this is in harmony with Scripture. Here's another one. The nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. Men cannot explain it because the Lord has not revealed it to them. Men having fanciful views may bring together passages of Scripture and put a human construction on them, but the acceptance of these views will not strengthen the church. Regarding such mysteries which are too deep for human understanding, silence is golden. That's a good piece of advice. Or else one can get so hooked up in theologies which link you to, well, dogmas which separate you from the Word, from obedience, and from Christ. What if a spirit comes and says, it doesn't matter whether you keep the law of God, but the spirit, according to the scripture, is supposed to lead you to obedience. Don't we then have a dichotomy of thought? Yes or no? Surely we do. The office of the Holy Spirit is distinctly specified in the words of Christ. Quote, when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. There's nothing here about exalting the individual. There's nothing here about great prosperity. On the contrary, you will feel rather laying in the dust because you will be reproved of your sinfulness you'll be pointed to the source of all righteousness, which is Christ, and you will see that there's a judgment, so you have a choice to make. You're either on this side or on that side of the fence. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts of sin. If the sinner responds to the quickening influence of the Spirit, he will be brought to the repentance and aroused to the importance of obeying the divine requirements. I believe that is in harmony with Scripture. Another one, to the repentant sinner, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, the Holy Spirit reveals the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. He shall receive of mine, says Jesus, and shall show it unto you. Christ said, He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, where is it recorded what Christ has said? In the Word, in the Scripture. So again, the Holy Spirit is always associated with Scripture. Christ says, speaking of the Comforter, he shall not speak of himself, he shall testify of me. This is quoting directly from the Scripture. So the Holy Spirit does not act as a separate entity seeking worship. He always directs one to the mediator, which is Christ. So he shall testify of Jesus. He shall not speak of himself. He shall glorify me. This is the function of the Holy Spirit. How little has Christ been preached? The laborers have presented theories, plenty of them, but little of Christ and his love. As the Savior came to glorify the Father by the demonstration of his love, so the Spirit came to glorify Christ by revealing to the world the riches of His love and grace. If the Holy Spirit dwells in us, our work will testify to the fact we shall lift up Jesus. Not one can afford to be silent now. The burden of the work is to present Christ to the world. All who venture to have their own way, who do not join the angels who are sent from heaven with a message to fill the whole earth with its glory, will be passed by. The work will go forward to victory without them and they will have no part in its triumph. Jesus said himself, how many people come to the Father apart from him? Nobody. So if a religious system denies Jesus Christ and says he doesn't exist in their religious system and they worship the Father directly, if they do not know the Son, the Bible says, then they don't know the Father either. Then they are praying, according to Scripture, in a vacuum. If, on the other hand, people acknowledge Christ, but they do not acknowledge 
the law. They claim you don't have to be obedient to the law if the truth is also the law. Well then, we have a crisis on that side as well. Acts chapter 2 verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. So this was the gift of Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover. And of course it was the commemoration of the giving of the law. So they waited those 50 days, which is a mini jubilee, and there was the outpouring of the Spirit. So Sinai was the giving of the law, and Pentecost was the preaching of the embodiment of the law. Christ, the Messiah, had come to demonstrate the character of the law. So this was why the Spirit was given, to magnify Christ and in Christ the law. Verse 6. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Now if you count the languages, there were 17 languages. And the Greek there is te idia dialecto, which means in their own mother tongue. Or even better, in that which they were born. So even the nuances of the language were such as if you were born into that language. Now, that's an incredible gift. Have you ever heard uh, a Frenchman speak perfect English with no accent as if he had been born into the English language or a German for that matter? No, you have to have a special privilege of God to be born into that language. So some people are born into more languages than others because they live in an environment where all of them are spoken at once. Then you can do that. But not everybody can do that. So here they were given the special gift to speak in these languages. And verse 8 says, And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born that takes the cultural background of the language and the nuances into account. It's perfect gift. Who confounded the languages in the first place and created them? God. And if you could do that instantly at the Tower of Babel, can it not do it instantly for the purpose of spreading the gospel? And of course this was a local little group with a small number of men that had to proclaim the gospel. What a time to give the gift of tongues so that they could preach to every nation under the sun without having to learn all of these nuances. Today, we don't have that crisis. We don't need the gift of tongues at every turn because we have people who can speak more than one language and can be interpreters and we can draw from them all over the place. So we don't need to have this. It doesn't mean that God cannot do it or will not do it under special circumstances. And I know of cases where there was an outpouring of this nature and I've met people personally who have had this experience. Either by hearing something in their own language which wasn't spoken in their own language or by someone speaking in another language that he was not accustomed or she was not accustomed to. So these things do happen, but in this case, it was to spread the gospel rapidly. Acts 2 verse 11, Cretes, Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Teus hematreus glossia, in our language. So what were they hearing? They weren't hearing gibberish, they were hearing what God had done and wrought. They were hearing the word of God preached. Now, if we want to know what the Spirit is about, then how much better to go and look at the Spirit's outpouring over Christ himself? Because this is the absolute manifestation. 
In Isaiah chapter 56, verse 3 and 5, there is the promise that there would be such an outpouring in other languages. Neither let the son of the stranger that has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, in other words, come into harmony with God's will and God's law, and take hold of my covenant, even unto them will I give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than sons and daughters. And then the Bible tells us that they will have manifestations and they will speak. The Holy Spirit convicts also of sin. And when he, the Holy Spirit, is come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now we've looked at that already. So this is the function of the Holy Spirit. We must be very clear about this. But Robert Schuller, in his Hour of Power broadcast, said, I don't think anything has been done in the name of Christ that, and under the banner of Christianity, that has proven more destructive to human personality and hence counterproductive to the evangelism enterprise than the often crude, uncouth, unchristian strategy of attempting to make people aware of their lost and sinful condition. Now, that is the exact opposite of the function of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit must convict you of sin, because if I'm not convicted of sin, why would I need a Savior, right? And because I'm convicted of sin, I'm looking for a solution, and it leads me to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ forgives me and puts me back into harmony with his will. That's the plan of salvation. This is totally contrary to the plan of salvation. But these people constructed mega churches in the world. The Holy Spirit also strengthens us against temptation. Even when it came to Jesus, the Bible says, Though you were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto them that obey him. Now we know that Jesus was sinless. And that Jesus had no propensity to sin. He was the sinless, spotless Son of God. But he was subject to the same troubles and turmoils and temptations that we have, and he laid hold of the power of God in the form of the Holy Spirit to resist sin, and the devil had to flee from him. So this is what it says. So we have access to this Holy Spirit because Christ has promised that this would be the case. So known sin actually silences the Spirit of God. Psalms 51 verse 22, poor David, who was in a spot after all that he had manufactured in terms of sin, says, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So why is it that people believe that the Holy Spirit was only poured out at Pentecost and didn't exist before. Well, you just have to go to Genesis and you'll see that the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. So he was there from the beginning. The only difference here and Pentecost is that the Messiah had not yet been born. And here in, at Pentecost, the disciples were empowered to preach Jesus as the Messiah. So here the Holy Spirit could direct them to Jesus, whereas in the Old Testament, he was only directing them in type to the Lamb that was to be slain on behalf of their sins. But it didn't preach Jesus until he came. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. So he will teach you all things. And because he will bring into remembrance what Jesus had said, he must lead you to the Word. The Holy Spirit will make the Word palatable so that you can internalize it and it can change you. And the Holy Spirit leads us to truth. And we are these witnesses of these things and so is the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that 
obey him. You cannot separate the Holy Spirit from obedience. You must also, in terms of one's personal life, separate the workings of the Spirit from the gifts of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit strives with whom to bring them to Christ? With all of humanity. The Holy Spirit is that still quiet voice which speaks in your heart and tells you that you have need of a Savior. This little voice that constantly reminds you of where you are transgressing God's law and gives you a conscience when you do something bad, even if you don't know Jesus Christ, that is the voice of the Holy Spirit. And it will prod you, prod you in a direction. It will prick you, as the Bible says. And Paul had a conscience. And when he looked into the eyes of Stephen and he saw that face, his conscience was pricking him, but he kicked against the pricks until he was convicted, and that changed him. So the Holy Spirit will always lead you to obedience. And when you have accepted Jesus as the Messiah, and you have accepted that you have to come back into harmony with his will and obey him, then when you are baptized, God pours out his Spirit so that he imparts gifts to you whereby you can effectively preach the gospel. It doesn't have to be a particular manifestation. It can be a simple thing like the gift of hospitality, of making people feel comfortable. It doesn't have to be a gift like being a, a speaker or an evangelist or whatever. And no one gift is better or higher than another. So the Holy Spirit would bring individuals to repentance of sin, guiding them in a fuller understanding of the truth about God's Word and Jesus Christ. That's biblical. We've looked at the texts. Secondly, it is the fulfillment that is to benefit those who are brought into the church by the gospel witness. John 17, 20, Acts 2, 38. So you become empowered by the Spirit to preach Christ. What's the first thing when you are converted that you feel when you realize I was lost and now I have this tremendous gift of salvation. What's the first thing that comes to mind? What about my? What about my? Isn't it? Mother. What about my father? What about my sister? What about my brother? What about my children? What about my grandchildren? Who puts those thoughts into your mind? You never had them before. Who put them there? Holy the Holy Spirit puts them there. And then what does the Holy Spirit impel you to do when you have those thoughts? You go and witness. That's the gift. Not some special manifestation where you sit down in luxury and enjoy it. It's always for the purpose of spreading the gospel. So the gift of tongues was to communicate the gospel to different language groups. And there's a definition in the Bible. And if a definition has been given, that is what applies. Acts 19, we see that tongues and prophecy are associated and thus serve to communicate the gospel. This is why tongues was given. 